This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf. Students of history are taught to see events through the eyes of people living in the era they are studying. From that perspective, history becomes less predictable, decisions seem less certain, and understanding becomes, in fact, more complete. Today's guest brings that discipline to the history of the Fourth Reich, a fear that has mobilized and motivated Europe and the world since 1945. He's Gabriel D. Rosenfeld, this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, scholars, journalists, filmmakers, and more, to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Gabriel Rosenfeld, a professor of history at Fairfield University, who's also the author of a fascinating new book, The Fourth Reich, The Specter of Nazism from World War II to the Present. Gavril, thank you so much for being with us. Great to be with you. So your book sort of surprised me when I picked it up because I was expecting maybe a sort of a, a, a look at sort of the, the popular portrayal of Nazi Germany and sort of like the fanciful notion of the man in the high castle, uh, but that's not what it is. It's, 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 it's really a, a history of the idea of a Fourth Reich. Yeah, I think the thing about the Fourth Reich is that it always suggests something frightening, a Nazi return to power. Uh, but when I started to research the book about a decade ago, I was noticing that in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the term Fourth Reich was being bandied about in the mass media in very uh, unpredictable ways. So, for example, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, about the most democratically inclined person you could imagine, was being accused of imposing a Fourth Reich on various European countries like Greece or Italy because of her austerity uh, insistence on uh, budget cuts. Um, the other thing, uh, since 2016, President Trump has been accused by many critics on the left of trying to impose a Fourth Reich on America. So the idea of a Nazi return to power um, has been expressed in some fairly odd uh, contexts. Uh, but I wanted to get to the truth of the matter, if you will, by researching the history of the term, dating it all the way back to the 1930s and seeing how it's evolved. And so in the 1930s, this was, this was an anti- Nazi slogan. Let's go back to that period and talk about the evolution of the term. Exactly. So Hitler in 1933 becomes Reich Chancellor. He establishes a quote-unquote Third Reich destined to last for a thousand years. And already right off the bat, a lot of his opponents, political opponents, people on the left, Social Democrats, Communists and others, Jews also who had fled uh, in the early 30s or the mid-30s to New York City, they were starting to employ the term Fourth Reich as a more progressive alternative to the existing totalitarian Third Reich. So just to give you two examples, there were Nazi, uh, anti-Nazi social democratic politicians in exile in Paris who were already drafting a constitution for a future Fourth Reich once the Nazis had presumably fallen from power. And then on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, above Morningside Heights, a lot of German Jewish emigres had, you know, sort of ad-libbed a new uh, designation for their neighborhood, which was called the Fourth Reich as well. Um, given these uh, somewhat puzzling facts from a present-day perspective, because we nowadays think of the Fourth Reich as a Nazi return to power, it's pretty clear that the origins of the term were quite different. This was sort of like in the European context of the, the I think at that point it's the Third French Republic, right? It's, it's, the, it's the, an indicator of what's the next regime. Yeah, well, the Third Reich itself has a fascinating history. Um, within the German context, you can trace it back to Charlemagne right. in the year 800, who established the first of the three Reichs. That's the Holy Roman Empire, which Napoleon Bonaparte uh, destroyed in 1806. And then you have the Kaiser Reich, and then the Third Reich. 
Um, and without getting into too much detail, you can, can go back to the book of Daniel and the whole dream that Daniel has uh, where King Nebuchadnezzar uh, is going to be told of a monster made of four metals, each of which symbolizes a Jew different monarchy that was oppressing the Jewish uh, people, and one of them was destined to be destroyed. And, you know, there's a very deep, rich history, um, but it does tell us that the Fourth Reich isn't just a political concept. It also has religious connotations as well. So what was the evolution of the term from the 1930s, as you just described it, which is a benign or benevolent word or, or term to, to paraphrase, to today? I mean, obviously, there was a lot of change that happened. What were the factors? And, and that's what your book is about. Right. That's a great question. So um, as I march through the six chapters of the book, what I try and do is show how there's a backstory to the Fourth Reich in the Third Reich uh, itself from 1933 to 45. But very quickly, in the years of Allied occupation of Germany from 45 to 49, uh, there were tremendous fears among American audiences, British audiences, and elsewhere that some unrepentant Nazis might actually try and return to power, that they hadn't accepted the verdict of May 8, 1945, and VE Day and the surrender of the Nazi regime, but they were going to try and fight on against uh, the Allies, whether from some Bavarian Alpine redoubt or elsewhere, uh, and they would try and reestablish a Fourth Reich on the ruins of the Third. Um, and there was the Nazi werewolf movement, which lent credence to that. There were efforts um, by unrepentant Hitler youth leaders to try and bring back a Nazi regime. Uh, and in all of those instances, which I describe in the book in 45 and 46, um, operations that have since become forgotten to history, like Operation Nursery or Operation Selection Board, crushed these rebellions with tremendous uh, allied firepower. Um, they didn't make the headlines, uh, as you might expect. Um, but if you go back to the newspapers, you'll see uh, news stories about allied forces crushing Nazi uh, werewolves and so forth. And what I wanted to try and do is ask the question, how serious were these threats of a Fourth Reich as early as 1945-46? Uh, because if you fast forward into the early 1950s, once West Germany had gotten its independence, there were further instances of former Nazi officials trying to return to power, overthrow the Adenauer government, and those two actually had to be crushed by Allied uh, intelligence services. And really only until the mid-1950s, when Germany's economy, West Germany's economy stabilizes, do you really find, I feel, at least, and I argue in the book, that the threat of a real Nazi return to power was banished once and for all. Um, but for the first 10 years, we would be mistaken to think that post-war Germany was on a stable foundation. Uh, there were certainly opportunities for uh, backsliding to take place, and I think it's healthy for us to keep that in mind as we... Well, uh, that seems to me to be one of the central arguments of the book, is that the, we talk about Germany now as the stable democracy in the heart of Europe. Uh, we talk about Angela Merkel as this great uh, uh, committed to liberal democracy. The new leader of the free world. The new leader of the free world <laughs> in some minds. Um, but th th where we are now was not a foregone conclusion. And I think that seems to be one of the central premises of your book, that there were moments where uh, the history could have changed. Right. So I think um, we're living right now in an era of alternate history and counterfactual history, a new golden age, we might call it. You, may, you mentioned the man in the high castle recently, uh, a couple minutes ago. Um, but my effort in this book is not just to tell a straightforward historical story, but also to weave in counterfactual uh, possibilities, uh, outcomes that never happened, that, but that might have happened, but for any number of certain circumstances. Um, so we don't want to take for granted that history was predestined to unfold as it did, that Germany was destined to become a healthy, prosperous, stable democracy. Uh, but there were m moments when Germany Germany could have moved backwards quite substantially, and if we can figure out why those mistakes were never uh, actually realized, why those tragedy, tragic outcomes were never realized, um, we can perhaps use, uh, we can learn some useful lessons for today when we, of course, see democracy being jeopardized in many places. So for those in our audience who may not be familiar with the term counterfactual history, define it for us. So counterfactual history is the... Um, very time-honored uh, tradition of historians to examine events that never happened in order to see how history might have been different. Uh, and this tradition of wondering what if dates all the way back to the ancient Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. Uh, and I'm actually presently writing a book about uh, the 3,000 year tradition of uh, Western historiography that employs what ifs. You can see it in medieval uh, histories of the Crusades. You can see it in the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. You can see it in the work of Machiavelli or Guicciardini in the Renaissance, all the way up to the present. 
important. But my all-time favorite um, quote is from the famous British historian Hugh Trevor Roper, who said, history is what happened, but we can only understand what happened in the context of what might have happened. So if we can understand the events that actually transpired, but being a, also be aware of what could have happened differently, for example, you know, the Battle of Lexington and Concord perhaps could have been lost. Perhaps uh, the French Revolution could have been nipped in the bud. Um, there are always moments where history can zig instead of zag, and if we fold those into the way history actually happened, I think we can better appreciate what actually happened. So, so what is it about human nature? I mean, you've just spelled out here this long history of what, a very long history of what ifs. Mm. What is, is it about human nature that makes us want to wonder what if? So there's I a, mean, I always wonder what if, it all, you know, from the small to the large, to things in my personal life, to of course, to things I read about in history. Yeah, what if I'd gone to a different college? What if my parents hadn't moved in third grade? What if I had married a different spouse? Yeah. You know, we can always wonder about these things. The question I like to ask is, why do we wonder about these things? Well, at that's the question. Yeah, why? Right. So right now we're living in a time of very rapid change. We all know about the technological change, the fear of global uh, warming, the you know, the fear of. Uh, you know, a, a wired world where everyone's losing jobs and will be all replaced by robots. Um, but in times of rapid change, you can see this in the Renaissance, you can see it during the Thirty Years' War, you can see it during the time of the Crusades. Um, Western, uh, the Western mind, at least, and I'll punt on the question of whether non-Western societies or civilizations uh, think counterfactual in the same way. I recently read, for example, that in the Chinese uh, language, I believe it's in Mandarin, the, the subjunctive is not as widespread as it is in Anglo-Saxon derived languages. So we can figure out if that's the case or not. And there's a that's social a science. For a whole other show. Literature. <laughs> but to, to cut to the chase, I think we could say that social scientists have, have argued that we always ask what if either to compensate for feelings of regret or relief. So if we have regrets about where we are in the present, if people are, let's say, regretting the outcome of the 2016 presidential election, they'll wonder what if, and they'll imagine scenarios in which things might have turned out better from their perspective. If, on the other hand, we've just gone through a tremendous calamity and we've escaped, you know, by the skin of our teeth, we may have relief and we'll imagine worse outcomes that make us feel better so to, about how So we, to boil it down, it's utopia versus dystopia. Yeah, and it's very much psychological, whether at the individual level or at the collective social level, I think we it, tend to see that uh, impulse. I, are, are we seeing more of the dystopian what if well, thinking got, these days? Well, and I think it's, it obviously goes along with party politics and partisanship and, and what your perspective is on the present. If you're bullish about the present or if you're somewhat downcast, you're going to have different perspectives. But The Handmaid's Tale's popularity, The Man in the High Castle, uh, any number of other uh, dramas that may... Very work, successful right? dramas, too, we should know. Of course. Yeah. And we can think about, you know, The Walking Dead, the zombie apocalypse. You know, it's all a metaphor for something. Yeah. Um, but there's a difference between a future-oriented dystopia and one that imagines a dystopia in the past. Uh, that's the difference between counterfactual history and just future-oriented so dystopias. So from a methodological perspective as a historian, so, mm -hmm. you know, typically think about historians toiling away in the archives, surrounded by dusty books and old documents, and uh, faithfully trying to recreate the decisions as they were made and the events as they happened. Mm -hmm. What's the method that you use if you're doing a counterfactual history? Well, a lot of counterfactual history involves comparative history, so I'll just give you a concrete example. Um, when we invaded Iraq, when the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, Condoleezza Rice and Donald Rumsfeld both um, tried to Poo poo fears that there might be a prolonged insurgency against Allied forces by saying that there were not going to be any Nazi werewolves uh, running around the right, scene. They actually used that they terminology. Did yeah. use that, uh, and their point at, of their point at, at the moment was to um, make it clear that we could be reassured that any potential resistance would be squelched, just like it had been in 1945-46. I wanted to reverse the comparison and say, well, what if, in fact, the Nazi werewolves had been as effective as the Sunni insurgents that fought against Allied forces for years after 2000? And what would the circumstances have been that might have allowed them to get away with more success, as was true in the Iraq context? And I came up with a couple of theories. Uh, perhaps the one that might be worth pointing to is the fact that in Germany after 1945, there were four Allied powers all cooperating to keep the Germans down after their defeat. And most Germans in, West, in the West um, were so grateful they weren't under Soviet occupation that they behaved. Um, after, 19, after 2003 in Iraq, you have the American occupying forces by themselves um, 
being in charge, and there was no good cop, good cop, bad cop dynamic that existed as did in the U.S. versus in the U.S. occupied zone versus the Soviet zone. Iran was also, uh, you know, fomenting a lot of mischief in the region. And if you just look at the comparative similarities and differences between the two cases, sometimes you can extrapolate and come up with some interesting speculative well, points. That raises sort of one of the issues that, as I was as I was reading the book, I was uh, kept coming back to is: Can you disentangle the idea of the Fourth Reich? from the broader Cold War history? I mean, much of the history of the Fourth Reich is um, a story of great power conflict. Um, there was, I suppose you could say, uh, a lot of propaganda coming out of the East German government, especially in the 1950s, promoting the, the, the claim that West Germany had, in fact, become a Fourth Reich. Um, it was a talking point for the Communist East to say that there was so much continuity between the Third Reich and Konrad Adenauer's West German capitalist state that I'd never say may as well be a Fourth Reich, and I actually document some and, and was that propaganda that. specifically for East German audiences, or was that for a broader? For both. Okay. In fact, especially in 1959, 1960, when, as we were talking about earlier, the uh, infamous swastika wave erupted, which was a worldwide wave starting in West Germany of swastika daubings and anti-Semitic vandalism against synagogues and other locations, which then spread to the United States in 1960 in the winter, January, February, March of that year, to the point when Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president, had to come out against it and deliver a speech against it. Um, that was the kind of thing that did um, make West Germany look quite bad, and it was very much serving the interests of the Communist East to make West Germany look bad in the eyes of the international community, um, to try to weaken the Western alliance and Germany's place in NATO. So you've written in this book and in many other books about Hitler and about the Third Reich. It seems to me there's an overriding question, at least I have in the back of my mind. What is, what is it about that period of history and that man that accounts for the profound and continuing interest in Nazism and in Hitler? It is profound and continuing. It's an excellent question. I mean, I think many people have the right motives in trying to plumb the depths of Hitler's evil. Um, some people have the wrong motives. Uh, there are plenty of neo-Nazis who take inspiration from the Third Reich and for their own racist or anti-Semitic reasons want to uh, perpetrate acts of violence in his honor. Uh, and there have been isolated examples I've followed on the web of discussion threads on neo-Nazi sites talking about the Fourth Reich in very positive terms and aspirational terms. Uh, but most people, thankfully at least, uh, view the Third Reich as the epitome of evil and I think it's especially um, engrossing for people because it's the history of our civilization. It's the history of Western civilization. Germany is still part yeah. of what we call the collective West. France, England, the U.S., Germany. Um, no matter how evil Stalin was, no matter how even Mao Zedong was, um, those civilizations, for better or worse, right or wrong, are still regarded as either semi-Western or non-Western altogether, uh, and they can be dismissed as somehow more foreign or alien, whereas Germany is still in the heart of our own Western liberal system, and if our system can collapse so catastrophically and create you know, a tragedy that kills 35 million people in Europe and 55 million people worldwide, we have to get to the bottom of that. So, so you teach at Fairfield, and yes. so you have young students who may uh, probably have learned some of this history before coming to Fairfield, but do you ever talk to them about their reaction to first learning this history, their emotional reaction. Sure, I think. Shock, I, anger, disbelief, this really happened. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to put words in What do they tell you? Well, it changes over the years. Um, 20 years ago when I started at Fairfield, um, there was still uh, an audience for the History Channel. Um, hmm. That's when kids who are 18 to 22 watch television. Now I think they're seeing <laughs> most of what they see uh, through their you know, various devices, their phones, their laptops, and so forth. And their YouTube. Yes, and much of what they see is now mediated through social media. Yeah. So in my book, High Hitler, which I published a couple years ago, I have a whole chapter on the place of Nazism on the internet today, and how memes and meme culture have transfigured the reputation of Hitler and the Nazis into something semi-humorous, if not totally humorous. And so that's the way that they oftentimes encounter Hitler first, and they know that he's a person who's being made fun of, but they don't always know why, and so I oftentimes want to get them into the door by drawing on the, that kind of imagery, but then getting very quickly to the history. There's, there's a, you know, there's actually, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, there was a meme that went around for a while, and it still pops up periodically of, uh, it's a film, and I should know what film it is, but it's Hitler in the bunker at yes, the end of the war. Fall. Yeah, and, and he's raging about mm -hmm. the collapse of German defenses in the city of Berlin, uh, and he's trying to give orders, and his, his advisors are saying, but you can't do that, you can't do that. That's been transformed into mocking of the 2016 presidential cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever the defense play in the Patriots some particular week is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and But your point in High Hitler, 
was that this is really about trivializing some really evil yeah, I think characters. I think that's a reflection of the fact that Hitler's evil in Western consciousness has begun to dissipate, um, not because we don't recognize that he did some horrible things, uh, but because over time what we find is that the eyewitnesses uh, that actually lived through the period, they're slowly but surely dying away, and the people who are, uh, you know, post-war baby boomers or people who have been born around the t turn of the millennium, they have no immediate contact with that history, and so they can play fast and loose with it. And of course, because irony is the dominant form of discourse on the internet, right. it kind of transfigures everything. So the downfall parody uh, videos that you're referring to, um, they're actually dedicated websites that have um, storehoused tens of thousands of those. And it's to the point now where when I give lectures at various um, locations, I can find uh, a video parody with a mention of the specific city that I'm actually going to be speaking in. So when I gave a talk at, for the Toronto Jewish community, I talked, uh, there was somebody ranting, who, who, somebody who created a video of Hitler ranting that the Toronto Maple Leafs hadn't made the playoffs. Yeah. When I was at the University of Oklahoma, somebody was, had produced one where the Oklahoma Sooners had lost to Iowa State. And it drives the point home that when people channel their frustrations and their resentments through a figure, Hitler, it, it articulates that very powerfully, but it also Ends us help, it ends up having us sympathize with Hitler, which is, I think, a dangerous well, uh, emotion but, but for us to But this wasn't inculcate. just a figure. This was Hitler. You go to a Holocaust museum. You see any of the photographs of liberations of concentration camps. You, you read Omar Bartov's work. He's been a guest on the show. And, and I could go through a very long list. I, I don't get it. I mean, how, how can you possibly use this? Well, let alone with marchers in Charlottesville walk, marching around with swastika banners right. and people in Eastern Europe who are Polish or Russian also gravitating to the swastika. I mean, when you think about countries whose histories are defined by tens of millions of their own people being slaughtered by Nazis and yet people gravitate to those symbols, it's, it's utterly... Well, it's not so, very so uplifting. You're, <laughs> so you're, so you're a, a practicing historian, I'm at least trained as a historian. Mm -hmm. Is this our fault? Have historians failed? Uh, in our pursuit of, of the, you know, the next round of cultural history or counting the number of French peasants instead of focusing on uh, you know, scholarship that sort of keeps these stories front and center in the public's mind, have we failed? Um, I don't think we failed, uh, and not only for reasons of defensiveness. I think, uh, <laughs> I think that's okay on this show. I think while lots of historians have written uh, works of scholarship that are very niche and that focus on very small areas, um, still the vast majority of historians who publish for a general audience are writing accessible uh, prose and are writing about very interesting topics. I think the problem probably lies in the school system where history, like the humanities in general, are just being given short shrift. Right. Uh, if you can't monetize something, at least in American culture, immediately, whether it's engineering, whether it's computer science, it's oftentimes seen as a luxury. And even though we're in a world now of 4% unemployment, you'd think that the humanities would be given more prestige, um, more uh, financial support, so as to be able to make it clear that the lessons we're learning from history are really important for everybody, not just people who are going to become professional historians or high school teachers. You need to have people who are going to be welders and computer scientists and maybe even the Silicon Valley moguls who are um, inventing tremendous devices but who have no understanding or background in the history of technology and the unintended consequences that can come with inventing the steam engine or the railroad or you know carbon uh, fossil fuels you know the automobile I think those things might be healthy for us to know more about across the board so so you're you're talking really about some type of educational reform in terms of what is taught and when is taught to young people in our country I think that would certainly it'd be certainly great to have more political support at the state level for state universities we could go down the list of various states that have cut funding for state universities uh, whether it's Wisconsin or Pretty Illinois substantially, very I mean, substantially yeah. and you know the investment that was given to higher education after World War II was tremendous and helped to educate an entire generation and more than that of, of American boys and girls so uh, you know I think that's 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 a given. Um, whether or not in American culture, and I guess I'm a little cynical having spent a lot of time in Europe, where, for example, in Germany you still have philosophers getting, you know, op-eds in, in the German media. <laughs> That's something kind of unimaginable in America. But, um, you know, the almighty dollar and the quest for profit does lead people, I think, oftentimes to try and go into fields that will help them make a lot of money. Business, obviously at the top of the heap. Um, if you can't be seen as making money through poetry or philosophy or history, it's going to be a smaller field, but by all means, we have to have it part of our core curriculum. There is a burgeoning, a burgeoning right-wing populism uh, in Europe, uh, in the United States too, but I'm, I'm thinking specifically about Europe right mm -hmm. now. Um, how concerned are you? Are you concerned 
that that movement has the potential to make your argument about the Fourth Reich more than counterfactual? I am concerned, and I think um, it's incumbent upon all of us who organize shows like this, who watch shows like this, who are interested in paying attention to the news in general through whatever medium, um, to understand the reasons for it. Uh, there are deep-seated social and economic reasons, obviously, for the turn to the right, whether it's the new waves of immigration, cultural fears of uh, Western decline in the face of Indian and Chinese ascendancy, or even racist fears of white decline in the face of a browning America, whatever it might be. Um, we have to understand that we're going through a period of rapid transition, just like we were in the 1880s to the 1920s in American history, there will inevitably be political ramifications. The question, I suppose, is how do you counter them? Yeah. Uh, how do you try and win people over to the bedrock foundations uh, and principles that have made America a thriving democracy over, you know, for 250 years almost, um, and not to lead them to take those values for granted so that certain politicians can run rough, ride roughshod over them um, and promote this process of normalizing things that are really no place in American history. Would you have any more specific advice for journalists or members of the media regarding what we're talking about here? I mean, I have to say I'm incredibly grateful to the journalistic community in the United States for keeping major issues on the front burner, uh, whether it's covering the Mueller report, whether it's covering um, the consequences of what's going on at the border in the terms of changing uh, immigration policies, whether it's the Flint water crisis. The fact of the matter is, is all the investigative journalism that we have in this country and that's really existed since the 19th century, uh, it's a tremendous asset because without information and without believable information that is supported by empirical facts, uh, we have no ability to act on anything. So I, I'm, you know, in my, in my alternate life I would have been a journalist, uh, but I think... Um, it's not too late. It's your own kind of <laughs> well, I try and write the occasional, the occasional op-ed every so often, or yes, the, yeah. uh, the, the alternate history would have... If I had me probably uh, that's chased. right. What if I did a journal? Right. If I hadn't been on the job market for years after getting my PhD in the nineties, <laughs> you wouldn't have been on our show. So exactly. there you go. We, we got about thirty seconds left. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, sort of, how your students. Uh, so we, we, we've talked about sort of the challenges coming out of high schools into the university setting, but how do they take to sort of when you present to them a counterfactual argument? It's, well, it's, easy, they... it's the easiest question you've given me all afternoon. It's, <laughs> they, they absolutely love it. Um, the thing they hate about history is the fact that it's seen as memorization and just a, yeah. an, an yeah, unending right. stream of facts. If they can use their imagination and be creative and, and contemplate how things might have been different if Pearl Harbor had never happened, the Japanese hadn't, you know, bombed uh, the American naval base there, would we have gotten involved in World War II at all? And if we hadn't, what would have the consequences been for American history? Those are the kinds of things that they like talking about. And if that incentivizes them to learn the facts so that they can wonder how they might have been different, then I think it's a win-win. Your students are lucky to have you. It's a, a, Indeed, and it's a great book. Uh, Gabriel Rosenfeld, thank you so much. The book is The Fourth Reich. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's Wayne, I'm Jim, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Charlotte Metcalf.